his right hand uh, there are pleasures forevermore heavenly father i want to thank you again this moment for your glory we magnify your name we thank you speak through me today oh lord oh use me as a channel of that brings restoration into the life of your people deliverance reconciliation have your way through me oh father speak through me with clarity i give each and every individual a heart of receptivity and a mind to comprehend have your way oh satan you have not been invited here a call on the name that is above every name this moment that God of glory saturate the atmospheric realm with the power of the resurrection and that blood that cleanses. That you wouldn't influence any individual. The only influence that will bring an impartation will be the power of the Holy Spirit. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. El Shaddai. Amen. Today, you know, the subject, the subject of the qualitative characteristics of a spiritual leader that I have been lecturing on would never be possible without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I was saying earlier that none of us would have the ability to go to God in prayer without the power of the Holy Spirit. I've been lecturing on spiritual leadership. Who is a spiritual leader? Every born again believer. Not just those at the pulpit, but all of us. You know... When you become born again, I used to say before I even have any deep theological studies, from my own studies, I deduce that when you come to that point in your life, faith takes you to this belief. When you believe, it leads you into the realm of confidence. In the realm of confidence, it takes you into the dimension of trust when you are in a dimension of trust you exemplify three essential elements in your life commitment devotion and dedication that is where you because you are now you trust the chair you are sitting in there you trust you did not sit in the chair thinking oh let me see if this chair is strong enough to hold me you trust you just you just sit it becomes a second nature to you when you become a christian you have this ability that you pray you worship you study or you read your bible then you witness when you do those four things you are also doing three C's that I mentioned earlier, you communicate what you learn with others. You connect with others in your community, at your job, in your home. You do that in collaboration with God the Father. So when I talk about qualitative characteristics of Christian, I'm referring to all that our lives should be characterized by these elements but whenever i as i i start to teach i had a testimony which gladdens and gave me joy there was a lady who says guess what there was a minister from this ministry and the folks referred to her as you sound like the, that minister and the, the minister says well look to vmi i said wow you see how 
God, we, because we always pray together, we worship God together, we study the Bible together, in collaboration with God, we are able to witness, we are able to communicate what we learn. That is what a Christian leader does. The other day, on the list, I have listed about just about 12 items, could be more than that. Today I'm going to add maybe discernment to that aspect. But I, I, I said something regarding gossip in the first segment. For some reason, when we first started here, that was the first message God gave me. It is an, a, a, just amazing that last week I have now listened to one of my favorite, uh, among them, you know, uh, I have a lot of favorite preachers, but Dr. Dr. David Jeremiah, I just turned on the radio, then he was teaching. Guess what he was teaching on? If I had listened to him prior, before teaching that subject, I said, Whoa, oh, what he said has impacted me. You know what he was teaching? He was teaching from the book 1 Corinthians on love, and he was talking about how love does not gossip. I said, Whoa! He said, Yeah! He said, yeah, some of you may say, yeah, it's truth. It's true anyway. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I had that in my pulpit. I had that in my church. I had the same thing. So some of you may say, no, it is true anyway. He said, it is true. Still gossip. I said, whoa. If I had had that, you see how the spirit works? Somebody way out there. And me here in the corner of Detroit. Teaching the same thing. I said, what? Forbid them, word for word. I said, no, some of you sitting here will say, no, it is true. He said, it's true, it's still gossip. <laughs> he said, some folks, you can only pick up the phone. Say, if you want a bad news in the, in the world, say, pick it up. Say, yeah, the gossip tank is going to give you all the gossip in town. Spiritual leader, that's not gossip. It drains you. You don't give your ears to things you know, once you begin to say, oh, I hear they say this, I heard they say that, it's gossip. You heard? How? You participated. So these characteristics, in order for us to be effective, we need them. We need to be resolved. Look, the enemy is pulling us back and forth. The plan of the enemy, the ultimate plan of the enemy. He says in John 10, 10, he comes to kill. He comes to divide. If he can pull you, me, against each other, oh, he win the battle. As long as we are not talking for God, we are talking about him, talking about each other, how we despise each other, how we don't like that hairdo, how we don't like the person that come to the church, how we don't like the shoe he has on. Oh, he's a winner. We're not talking about God. He's a winner. And one of the things the enemy does of how we, we, we relish in other folks, unfortunate, we do it unknowingly sometimes. Your kids, my kids, maybe some problem. So, thank God it's not my kid. Oh, indirectly. 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 We said, so he's teaching the same thing I'm teaching from love perspective. Spiritual, characteristic, uh, qualitative characteristics of a spiritual leader. If you haven't yet heard this, you might want to go back to I, 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 I have all this on the, um, what I call apologetics. Those of you who may think maybe apologetics is to apologize. No, I'm teaching how we can defend ourselves within. Because if you are rooted and grounded in the word of God, sister or brother comes to you with opposing view, 
what does what that does it kind of like it undermined your faith it brings your confidence level down what happens is now you begin to look to the church like and you forgot that it is not my church it is not your church Jesus said I will build my church not me <laughs> I'm an instrument, very important one, of course, you are instrument. We are his feet, we are his hands, we are his eyes, we are his, oh, that is collaboration. That is how he designed it. Qualitative. So I have it under, under uh, what I call uh, apologetics. Today, this uh, 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 a subtitle I don't have on the screen. You don't see apologetics, but this is episode 13, which is still under apologetics. I talk about apologetics from, uh, and I'll be going into the uh, history of uh, uh, Nation of Islam when I'm done with this. No, I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, theolo a, theolo a theological student. I can proudly talk about that. Yes. It took me a long time, but I can teach you that. I qualify for that. I'm studying for that. I'm studying for my master's in divinity. Sometimes you have to tell folks for them to know. So how, what qualifies you to teach me? Yes, that qualifies me to teach you. Uh-huh. Sometimes Paul came out one day, said, hold it. And he, he laid it all out. Said, you think you are weak? Am I not weak? You think you're hungry? I've been hungry too. How many times was I shipwrecked? Fast, force fast. <laughs> Whip. Stoned. They spoke about me wrongly. You think you are the poor lady or sometimes you have to tell folks. You have to let them know. So apologetics. I have given constructing, contrasting view regarding uh, Islam and that of Christianity. Today I'm doing this lecturing on characteristics, qualitative characteristics of a spiritual leader. You see, God's accomplishment spiritually can never, I cannot do this in my ego pride in the state in the pride's condition I can't do that and expect God to bless me spiritually you know here in the world uh, when I was my first Bible college we did some leadership and uh, most of the teaching were secular bring in secular leaders Oh, uh, McDonald's leader, Rick Kroc, and, and this man, and, and that man, they are not spiritual leaders. And we do that all the time in the church. It starts with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to use one characteristic on our list for demonstrative purpose. Visionary. I said something that today I know we're going to go to self-control. But before we get there, a spiritual leader must have a foresight. A spiritual leader must have the ability to see beyond the scope of his proximity. A spiritual leader would not and cannot be confined to only his environment or his proximity here in Detroit it is true that we are among predominantly African-Americans does not mean that we limit ourselves to African-American congregation we have to be purposeful we have to be intentional there is always either from Theologians or preachers, this contrasting view regarding Matthew and Paul. They said, 
Matthew was sent to the Jews spiritually accurate and Paul was sent to Gentiles spiritually accurate. But you have to ask yourself, who is a Gentile? Remember, we are talking about qualitative characteristic of a Christian leader or a spiritual leader. Then you ask yourself, who is a Gentile? A Gentile is unbeliever. Who is unbeliever? You can think about from social economic perspective, from demographic, age, ethnicity, religion, everyone fall under that as a Gentile, infidel. So when we talk about that, we stick with that. Then we bring in some uh, secular teaching. Say, so, well, I have that question been asked to me. He said, uh, Pastor, uh, what is your target? Target? My target is unbeliever. Who is your target? Our target should be unbeliever. Who is unbeliever made up of? All colors, all shapes, all height, everywhere, all languages. Not only me who sound this African, American, British, my accent is just mixed. Some folks think I'm from Jamaica. Yeah, I get that a lot. I'm like, I get that a lot. I said, thank you. <laughs> but a Gentile is a group, you know, made up of all these folks. A spiritual leader as a visionary, our, our target is unbelievers. So we are out there passing our flyers. Is anybody that is going to say yes? No. <laughs> of course. Sometimes I tell folks, if you're not going to read it, don't take it. This costs some money to print. Please, if you're not going to read it, don't take it. There's somebody out there. Would I want everybody to take? Yes, of course. But obviously, it isn't everyone that you and I are going to witness to. Look, when Jesus was here in the flesh, the God incarnate, whom we know as Jesus Christ, that's exactly what it is, God incarnate. When you think about Jesus, the incarnate God, Jesus Christ. James, his brother. You know, James didn't know Christ until Jesus ascended on her. Do you think it was not Jesus' desire? For his own brother, biological brother, to know him. And the Jews, no, even take the Jews out. His own brother, family right there. Don't you think it is his desire? Yes. Why could he make it? It can force him. As a spiritual leader, you and I will focus. Don't allow. I don't allow anyone else. I used to be. Oh, who's your target? I'm like, hmm, target? What do you mean? My target? Am I supposed to be a Christian? Everybody that does not believe in Jesus Christ, my target. Brother, sister? <laughs> would that mean I, I would win everybody? No. I wouldn't win everybody. Are we here? Are we getting something here? Now. In the secular leadership training, emphasis are placed on a target group. These could range from, like I said, demographic of social economic status, age, ethnicity, religion, etc., etc. We more often than not hear many preachers. You know, a light assessment of you know bringing Paul and and and. Matthew into the picture. Even when you read the book of Luke, for instance, is it applicable? Yes. You know, Luke has a lot, but then theologically you, you, you realize that Luke was talking about what was happening to people, not really doctrine. We're going to be going to some of those things in the near future. Our target. 
When you pull up here in a parking lot, did you see a lot of park cars parked there? A lot of cars. What do you think the folks here are? Do you think they are in church? <laughs> exactly. Today, exactly. Today is Sunday, isn't it? Our target is them. What you know, what I know, what I believe, trust me, is the ultimate. No one else. Not a Buddhist. Not a Hindu. Not a Muslim. Not an atheist. Not agnostic. Not even a deist. A deist is someone who says, oh, God is this wonderful watchmaker. You make the watch, wind it, and let it to run by itself. Meaning, God created the world and lived it. No, the one who created the cosmos continue to sustain the cosmology. He didn't just leave it to run by itself. Sometimes when you and I don't hear from God, providentially, he's still working. Meaning, you might not hear audible voice. You might not hear a word from someone, but providentially, he's Working. So you take some steps sometimes. It's like, why did I do that? It was later. It's like, oh, that was God. That is providence. Did you ever wake up one day and say, well, I need a word. I need a word. I need a word from the Lord. I need a word. And you, you've taken a step. That is a spiritual leader. You need that discernment. You remember I was giving you my own problem. I had this heavy weight from the spirit that I can't shake off. Not knowing it was a very good suggestion which was not prime time. It wasn't time for me to implement. It took a tremendous discernment for God to show me that. A spiritual leader, you need a that. Again, my answer to those who ask is, no, irrespective of their ethnicity, you know, I for everyone who hear the gospel. When you and I do that, we are because we are required by the Great Commission. What did the Great Commission say in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20? It said, go! Go! How do you go if you don't have the power? How many times do you run into somebody that you feel like mm, you want to witness, but you don't have the energy? You know you want to do it, but you, you don't have what it takes. That is when you know, ah, oh, got to be praying. <laughs> you know, it happened to me. You know, it's like, man. But when you are oozed with the spirit all the time, you only look for an opportunity. Say, woo, here comes an opportunity. You need a gospel. This is why I'm doing apologetics. In apologetics, you can speak the good news without quoting scripture. You bring the person's mind to the word of God. You capture his imagination, then you brought in the word of God. Because look, you and I can quote passages. Somebody out there know nothing about what you are quoting. You start quoting and say, ah, these Christians, he lives. That is not your aim. Listen to what Paul says. When I said, you and I cannot be true or exemplify our spiritual leadership without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Paul says. Yes, we're going to go to self-control. Don't worry. We're going to go there. First Corinthians chapter 2 says, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. Man, we can come brilliant of speech. Even in theological studies, when you go to 
master's level when you are making your way to PhD level if you are not. No, you, you can come, you can come with really polished, let me use that word. Oh, you can be really polished. But if you're not careful, you'll be polished without the spirit of the Lord. Because they give you all this polished information. Paul here is saying, when I came to you, remember Paul never said, I don't have the ability to come with man's wisdom or man's ability. He said, when I come to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul was this Christocentric in theological terms. He was Christ-centered. He just talked about the crucifixion, the cross, the tongue, the pierced the scarf of our Lord. He didn't go there. Of, remember, Paul, in today's day, according to many theologians, Paul could have been holding about maybe multiple PhDs. If, if you've done some academic work, it's heavy load. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So that means Paul can come to you in any way. He can come to you from human perspective, from human wisdom. He has that. He's well educated. Well spoken. Well informed. But he said, no, I didn't come to you with that. Somewhere in his letter he said, I count all those things dead. Because he said, he, said, he says, no, he said, I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. In weakness and fear. Now, sometimes when I approach folks, I say, well, 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 how come this strong accent? I say, yeah, I'm not coming to you with my strong accent. I'm coming to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ changed my life. Jesus revolutionized my life. If I tell you, not to, when I first came to Michigan, I have many miracles. But one miracle that I remember vividly again is when a meeting was scheduled for me to meet some of these um prison ministry workers because I was trying to establish one and the guy brother Gary who has who is now has his PhD and uh, he scheduled an appointment for me I you guys know me I am not a late comer I, I I'm not somebody who is habitually if you expect me so I know Pastor Sam no I know if he said 10 o'clock, no, I know he's going to be late. No, I'm not like that. That's not me. So, but I make, I, I run late sometimes. Right. But on this day, I was late. Why? I don't know. That time my wife has not passed away. So why? I don't know why I was late. But I was late regardless. When I got there, it was pouring. I mean, it was raining. So when I got there, I said, God saved me. I said, it is not just man wisdom. When I got there, man, I have no umbrella, I have no raincoat. I said, Lord, and I'm late. I can see from the window. Folks were sitting. I said, Lord, can I get in there? I'm late. I, I said a short prayer. I don't know exactly the words. I don't remember the exact words, but it took like maybe about three to five minutes. Long three, five minutes. You know, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All of a sudden, I saw the rain stopped, and I went in. Right away, uh, Brother Gary, Dr. Gary, rush, he come to me and say, Pastor Sam, where is your umbrella? I said, umbrella? I said, I have no umbrella. Where's your raincoat? I said, I have no raincoat. how did you get in here? I said, just, say, it's raining. If you see, his mouth was opened. 
his eyes wide. How did you get in without getting wet? That is one miracle of many miracles that God did in my life. To me, the rain stopped, but it looks like the rain never stopped. Yes. But to me, uh, just like it happened to Peter when he was in jail, to me the rain stopped and there was no, I was no wet. Like the three Hebrew boys in the furnace fire. Because no sooner did I get in than he ran, he ran to me. He said, where is your umbrella? Inquiring, where is your raincoat? Why aren't you wet? Where? How did you get it? That was his question. How did you get in here? It is raining. Meaning, who are you? What do you have? No, I have Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. When we were at the old place, we were having vigilant quarterly prayer night. We were just a handful. As I was praying, as I was praying, God revealed there was a lady. I just saw her. But she was fighting with her mother-in-law. I don't know her mother-in-law. I don't even know that was her mother-in-law. I said, I saw you. Say it's true, but how do you know? I said, the Lord revealed that to me. Now it was like a video. Then I saw a young man having a fight with just like the age of my son. So I called him. I said, you fighting with a young fellow. You're going to be, you be going to be gone for good. Say, it's true, but how do you know? The way he said it, he said, no, it is true, but how you a man, how do you know? I said, the Holy Spirit revealed that to me now as I'm praying. Then I saw a lady that my folks know, that I don't know that she was a promiscuous lady. I never knew. God had revealed that to me that night. I saw the lady in nicely dressed with a purse by her. She was not in the meeting that day. Three days after that, I believe two or three days, me and my daughter and my son were driving. We were going to the church. I saw the lady, and I was screaming. I, I hope they were here. They confirmed me. I said, whoa, this is what I saw. Whoa, this, she was not there. This, because when you, as a spiritual leader, when you preach Christ crucified, him and him alone, demons may come, but they can't stand. They'll try but don't win. Paul, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. This pulpit, sometimes when I want to stand here, I just don't tell you guys. Some folks say, yeah, you, yeah. In the presence of God, you have this, I don't know why, you saw me, you saw me knelt about 35 minutes ago, right? And you saw me on my knees about 35 minutes ago or whatever time it was. That is some of the reasons. It is when you are a spiritual leader, you always, you have that spirit of trembling. You, you may not come across like that. Because you are dealing with the Holy God. Who at this moment can say, Henry, come home. I just drop dead and he goes, say, something happened to the pastor. You don't know. And then they say, no, Lord, don't do it. <laughs> but no, he can do that too. He can. I say, I did not come to you. I came to you in, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Verse 4. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom but with a powerful demonstration of the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Verse 5 says, So that your faith might not be based on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So as a spiritual leader, we don't learn from the secular leaders. Did they have some wisdom? Yes. But we're talking about the things of the spirit. I was telling us last time that anybody that have a business here, uh, unless a person believes in God, he, he doesn't come and say, Lord, please, when I go to work today, may you bless my business. No. They got up 
when you have some drink last night, maybe a little bit, um, 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 uh, uh, have a little bit in the system, get up in the morning, shoot, they come to work. You and I, we can't do this without prayer. You got to bless them still because that is how God designed things. He said, he said, rain on both the righteous and unrighteous. I was telling the Muslim last time, I said, brother, it is not Allah that you think you bow down to five times a day that has blessed you. No, that Allah does not exist. I said, sincerely and in humility, it is the grace of God. I said, it is not your five times. I said, no. I said, I know some of you. Some of you are so crooked. Hey, some Muslims are so crooked. And they'll just finish prayer. Just like all of us. They'll do something sometimes. Say, Ooh, Henry, that was not good. Do you do something soft sometimes? Say, wow, Henry, did you just do that? <laughs> Henry, did you just do that? No. A spiritual leader does not come or learn from. We learn all truth is God's truth. But when you want to learn spiritual things, you learn it from God. Don't take your truth, your eternity, from opera. <laughs> I'll say this again and I'll say it over and over again. I love Oprah. I pray for her every once in a while when her name comes to my mind. Yes, she may not know that. Don't take spiritual things from Oprah. She is lost. You need to be praying for her. Now, New Age movement. That's what she believed. She believed that all roads lead to the same. All roads does not lead to the same destination. Common sense tells you that. Don't take that from Oprah. I remember I was part of a business many years ago, and the guy brought up a book. He said, well, Oprah recommended this book. I said, who's Oprah? He said, well, Oprah is, well, he, she has a lot of money, and you better follow her. You're not going to say, count me out. Mm -hmm. I'm not learning no spiritual things from Oprah. Mm -hmm. She's lost herself. How do you expect me to be learning anything from her? You, you heard me. Go tell her. It's this pastor here that she's not. Yeah, I'm not letting it. Oprah, I've been praying for you. Go watch my videos. I prayed for some of you by name. It's on record. It's on file. Someone else, aside from Moses, had demonstrated the wisdom of God as a spiritual leader that I have already mentioned. Who was that? Paul. Paul's ministry was characterized with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is true today that we don't see the things that took place in the first century because, remember, this was new religion. There's no movement. God had to do something to convince folks. Jesus even said, the miracles, if, he said, if you don't believe me, for the miracles' sake, that means Jesus did some miracles for folks to know that he is the incarnate God. So yes, some of those things are still not happening today. That's not mean that God cannot make it happen. But Paul, his ministry was characterized by, by that kind of power. This brings me to self-control. It is self-control that confines us within that realm. You and I have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Remember God gave us will. We can resist. Oh yeah. You can say no. Oh yes of course. <laughs> you can say no. Yes of course. And that was the many reason when I tell folks this um there was this many reasons why God has given us freedom of choice at the first place. Ability to choose against three essential elements. Rebellious, disobedience, and rejection. God knows that these knuckleheads, when I give them ability to choose, they're going to reject me anyway, but he gave us anyway. Why would he do that? 
did that because we are not forced to do anything. We are not forced to follow him. He's not creating robots. He created real breathing humans who can say no to him. But in the midst of that, he created us anyway, giving us the ability to say no to him. So self-control. Acts chapter 24 verse 25 says, Now as he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix became afraid and replied, Leave for now, but when I am or I find time, I will call you later. Yeah, how many times we go to folks say, "Hey, you better believe in Christ." Say, ah, just I think you, you better leave now. I think I, I, I got a phone call. Most of the times we do that now. Hey, I got a call. Okay, this is a very important call. Can I take the call? You come back later. Did you ever witness to somebody who tells you that? Yes. Self control. You and I need that. First Corinthians seven uh, five says, "Do not deprive one another." This is self control within marriage, folks. But I give it to you anyway. Do not deprive one another sexually, except when you agree for time to devote yourselves to prayer. So that means married couples sometimes you because of prayer, prayer and fasting, but. Uh, let me let me give you caution. If you are married, and both of you are not in agreement of prayer, uh, f prayer and fasting, unless God spoke to you, one individually. How old are you? I'm fine. Spoke to you in the. I mean, if He spoke to both of you, and you guys are uh, agreed together. If God spoke just to you, and you have to fast and pray. Just you, you are married. You can't deprive your, your spouse. Hey, I'm fasting. No, God didn't speak to him or her. Don't deprive them, both of you, unless both of you agree. If you do not agree, that is where self-control comes. Self-control can go to many areas, spiritual leaders. If you are listening to me on, on, on YouTube, I think this is something that you should learn. Anybody who tells you, oh man, we are married and we're supposed to be praying. If it is not, if it is not mutually, if you guys do not agree, and one person, oh, you leave me, I'm fasting. Really? God doesn't hear that fast. No, God wouldn't hear that. So do not deprive one another sexually except when you agree for time to devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of lack of self-control. Self-control. You and I have to make that decision. Even in our leadership. Self-control. This is fast with kids. How many times do you discipline your kids? And sometimes, sometimes... Sometimes you realize just a discipline, but it was something that triggered that. I'm a dad, so I get it. Self control. Sometimes, even when it comes to discipline, as a leader, self control will take you to God. Lord, I'm angry. <laughs> I tell my kids, sometimes I call, I say, You did A, B, it resulted. In XYZ, it makes me angry. Yeah, I said it like that. I said, it makes me so angry. When I'm able to, that's self control. You are able to verbalize how you are feeling. You put words to your emotion so you don't get out of hand. <laughs> self control. Heavenly Father, uh, you know. Um, it's amazing. One hour has already passed, and I don't want to go past one hour by teaching.